Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board. And uh, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and your lovely dog. Um, so I do have a couple of updates to uh, the public comments and schedule as well as the upcoming schedule. First, I wanted to let folks know that we are currently accepting public comments on the essential health benefit benchmark plan proposal that was presented on January 26 by the Department of Financial Regulation. We are extending that public comment period, so we want all public comment period. All public comments should be submitted by close of business February 25th in order to be considered by the board before voting. And the board is now scheduled uh, potentially to vote on this on March 2nd. So then that um, also updates the schedule for next week. We will be getting additional updates from um, folks at DFR as well as um, the Director of Healthcare Reform. And then we will take this back and vote on March 2nd. So all of that information is on our website. Also, we have ongoing public comment regarding a potential next agreement with CMMI, and we are taking those public comments and have been for the last year or so. We are sharing any comments with our partners at a Agency of Human Services, as well as the governor's office, as they are leading the negotiations on a potential next agreement with our federal partners. And just a, a quick announcement about um, next week, um, the primary care advisory group will be taking place from five to seven or five until when it ends um, next Wednesday, February 16th. And that is all I have to report. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, February 2nd. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 2nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously. So the agenda item for today's discussion is the DIVA 2023 proposed um, update on uh, the QHP. So um, Dana or Sean, I'm not sure who's teeing things off, but whenever you guys are ready, go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, I'll, I'll uh, start us off. Um, thank you for having us back, uh, following up on last week's meeting to present the uh, proposed plan designs for 2023 for the standard QHPs. Uh, so today I'm joined by Sean Sheehan from DIVA and our actuarial partners from Wakely Consulting, Julie Pepper, Brittany Phillips, and Brooke Steiner, I believe is with us as well. So uh, we do have a few things prepared to discuss to today with you, and then obviously we'll go to Go to questions, but if, if it's all right, I'll I'll start things off. Sounds great. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so first I'd like to circle back to a question that um, remember Lunge raised last week about. Um, why the the choice was made to um, propose the three office visits, um, primary care um, and behavioral health um, at the silver and bronze level and not the um, platinum and gold. So I'd like to revisit that and show you some modeling that you did not see last week. So this was in the um, handout that was uh, distributed to you folks, I believe, uh, yesterday or or late Monday. So what we talked about last week, this is the platinum plan design. Um, we have the recommended plan and these 
the alternative plan here that uh, stakeholders were putting forward. Um, Want to point out that um, this is modeling for three PCP visits. That is like the recommended plan um, with the same changes here. The addition of the three PCP or mental health visits. And so it raises the um, AV probably behind the scenes. Is, is, you know, it's a rounding thing. And then um, you know, really no difference with um, the directional impact on premium. We wanted to model that out for you. As I said last week, the um, the way we approach our um, uh, discussion around each plan is we start at the platinum level and work our way down to the less rich plans. And um, <clears throat> early on, stakeholders um, made the decision that um, at least at the initial presentation, we would not uh, go with proposing PCP visits at the platinum or gold level thinking that for these richer plans, it's less of a valuable add to, to the benefits. Um, and then also not under, not knowing exactly how the board would react to the proposal for, the, um, for these visits. Um, again, we thought we would start with proposing it in silver and bronze, not platinum and, and uh, gold, but here they are for you to see. Then moving on to the Gold plan. Um, again, this alternative plan two over here is um, identical to the recommended plan with the addition of the um, first three PCP or mental health visits um, without cost share. Um, in this one, just want to point out that brings the AV to the very top of the acceptable de minimis range here at 82 percent, but uh, for both platinum and gold, it is in fact, um, it can be accommodated in, in compliance with the AV ranges, as Brittany said last week, um, but for the reasons I mentioned, we uh, did not propose those, but certainly wanted to show that to the board um, as one additional alternative beyond what the uh, stakeholder group has recommended with you know with the, the recommended plan and the first alternative there's the second alternative plan for those two so i hope that's helpful um are there any other questions about the platinum or gold deductible plans any questions from board members not a question but i did want to say thank you very much for bringing back the modeling it's super helpful okay good um, Brittany or or others from Wakely, are there any things that you wanted to add that I may have missed? All right, good. I'm, I'm glad that was helpful. We certainly wanted to, yeah. you know, present um, things transparently. There was a lot of discussion at all of the all of the metal levels, and um, you know, again, we can see the value of the. Um, the three PCP visits, but it it comes especially at the silver and bronze levels. It comes with um, some trade offs that can be a little bit uncomfortable in terms of other cost share. So. Good, I think now, Sean, I would turn it over to you to um, give us a walkthrough of the 2022 January enrollment picture. Um, Sean, do you have that to share or would you like me to? I have it right here. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, Dan, if you want to share it, that'd be that'd be great. Here we are. Okay. You just tell me when you'd like to advance, Sean. I'll, can everybody see that? Yes. Good. Great, absolutely. Yeah. So this this should look uh, should look familiar. Um, format we've done in in past years. On the on the left, uh, you have the the covered. Lives. This is a snapshot as of January 2021, uh, effectuated in 
enrollment. Uh, this is this is the individual enrollment on on exchange uh, enrollment here, so it's not not including the uh, direct the direct enroll qualified health plans, which as of last January was was about seventy five hundred or so. Um, and then on the on the right, you have the uh, as of last month, the January twenty twenty two covered covered lives. Um, so a couple couple things to to point out there at a at a high level, just in terms of numbers of of overall enrollment, um, you'll see the see the uptick there, which we um, attribute largely to it's about a five point two percent increase from um, that, that 24,215 enrollment up to the 25,470. Uh, a lot of that is um, going to be the, the direct enrolls transferring over with uh, both Blue Cross and MVP. Um, in addition to the, the state have been reaching out and get, getting the message out about more people being able to take advantage um, of, of the subsidies. So we still have more work to do on that front. The issuers are continuing to conduct outreach uh, to their members, letting them know that they're not tied to uh, to open enrollment to transfer their plan. They can do it any time of year. We put out a press release um, from Diva to that effect uh, a couple of weeks ago as as well. Um, and but the other the other kind of overarching uh, factor or behind the scenes factor maybe is is the continuous coverage uh, requirement with with Medicaid. Uh, and and so that that was what led to kind of put this in context. The numbers you would have looked at last year, looking at January 2020 to January 2021, um, that was a 7.6 percent drop um, in enrollment from 26,219 in 2020 down to this 24,215. Um, that that drop is largely attributed to with the public health emergency and that continuous coverage requirement means that the, the Medicaid to qualified health plan churn, which is usually two directional uh, for the last two years has just been one directional. So anybody who qualifies for Medicaid at any point moves into the into Medicaid, uh, but when their income moves above, they they don't, don't move out of it. So as a result, the Medicaid uh, caseload is up over 30,000 in the last um, two years, once that unwind happens, we we expect a, a you know, proportion of those um, to come in. So I think the that that drop, um, big drop we had from 2020 to 2021, the overall QHP individual uh, be both through the marketplace through Vermont Health Connect together with direct enroll should be pretty stable from from 21 to 22, and the reason. We expect not having that drop, even though the Medicaid numbers were continuing to grow. But the people that moved into Medicaid um, were offset by, like, by people coming into uh, qualified health plans. Um, hopefully, in in uh, response to those expanded subsidies, um, which Vermonters benefited from more than any um, any other state, according to um, a federal report this this fall. So that's the overall context. Uh, we have the numbers on on this on this slide as far as raw raw numbers of um, of covered lives in the in the plans. If we go to the next um, slide, we have the the uh, the proportions here, the percentages. So you can see in in terms of each types of plans, which ones uh, are you know, have the, the biggest enrollment. And then on the next the next slide, um, we'll be we don't have to go there yet, but the next slide will show the, um, you know, the change from the from the year to the year, so you don't have to to do the do the math in your head, <laughs> looking at these at these pieces. But you can see those standard deductible plans, um, you know, still are the biggest, uh, you know, the, the biggest in terms of the, the largest proportion of um, of plans with high deductible plans having um, having smaller, but but you know are gaining. Um, there going up to, you know, 22.7 between between the standard and non-standard high deductible plans, um, but still, you know, over over three quarters of of people in deductible plans, um, and you know, close to half, uh, well over over half in the in standard plans between the deductible and the and the high deductible. 
Um, if anyone wants to talk here, ask questions, we can always flip back to it. But then let's let's flip to the next slide um, first, just to see the see the heat map here of what's what's hot and what's what's cold. Looking at twenty, uh, the change in in covered lives from January twenty one to January twenty twenty two which actually I should have referenced earlier as well. The one other kind of wild card in addition to uh, people transferring from direct enroll into the marketplace, uh, the issue with the subsidies, the issue with the, the Medicaid continuous coverage. The other factor is that open enrollment was longer this year uh, than in most of the last few years. Open enrollments ended on December 15th meaning that January is typically the, the peak of the highest you know, highest enrollment um, of the year. With this year, with um, open enrollment running through January 15th, um, we, uh, people who came in between December 16th and, and January 15th will have a February start date. As a result, we, we would expect those February effectuated enrollments um, to be the high point of, of this year as opposed to, um, to January. And as I referenced, it was just the the January over January in the marketplace was up just over five percent. Um, we expect the February over February to be up, you know, six to seven percent based on uh, the number of plan selections we had and kind of applying if, if we have a consistent proportion of people actually making their their initial binder payment and effectuating, we should be about six to seven percent up February over February. Uh, looking here, starting at the catastrophic, you can see that drop there. Again, it's not big. On the right, it's only a drop in 73 covered lives, but it is a 31% drop as we don't have many people in catastrophic plans. That's one to call out that, that during this open enrollment, um, we we did more active outreach and, and hold hand-holding um, to a few groups of, of people. One of those groups was people enrolled in catastrophic plans. Uh, because of the expanded premium tax credits under the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, people who um, people could have quite quite a high income and receive premium tax credits that they could apply to a bronze through platinum plan, but they still can't apply it to the catastrophic plan. Um, that's a similar dynamic to what we had before, but before when you had that subsidies capped at four times the federal poverty level, if your if your income was above that four times the poverty level, about $50,000, $51,000 for an individual, uh, a catastrophic plan could make sense. Um, now with those higher subsidies, you'd have to have a much higher income and you'd, you'd still be able to get a bronze plan for a lower net premium than a catastrophic plan. So we did uh, phone calls out outbound and, and emails outbound to people in catastrophic plans, encouraging them to look at the plan comparison tool, look at all their options. Um, and, and that's where you see that 31% drop. I think part of that is the impact shown there. Um, the, one of the other pieces you see really with the, uh, the silver variations in the, the silver 73%, 77%, 87%, 94%, those are the cost sharing reductions level levels, which um, the increasing generosity is at the lower um, income levels. So people at 94% and 87% are the people whose income would be less than twice the federal poverty level. So for an individual, uh, about under $25,000, $26,000 for, um, for a family of four, under $50,000, $51,000 or so, people just over the Medicaid level. And so as I was referencing before with that one-way um, churn going into Medicaid but not coming back, we saw our overall numbers from 2021 to 20. 22 um, increase at the higher income levels, uh, kind of hold their own at the 200 to 300 percent level, and drop in the under 200 percent um, level. Again, that wouldn't be a you know, really be a surprise when you think about those income churn and people, you know, being more likely to move full from the lower income levels into into Medicaid and not come back. But when you see that silver 87, 94, um, the drop, you know, those are the people who, when they are in are eligible for the 87 and 94 percent. We do significant hand holding to them as well if they happen to be in a bronze, gold, or platinum plan, letting them know the benefits um, of that silver plan, and particularly under the American Rescue Plan Act, um, how they're virtually guaranteed to have lower total costs um, being in a silver plan. But that that drop is more more due to the overall um, 
drop in people at that income level uh, as they're moving to me to Medicaid. So we expect when the when we start unwinding from the public health emergency, uh, those numbers to come back up, and um, we have plans in place to um, help people uh, with their plan selection and seeing the benefits of the cost sharing reductions as well. Um, beyond beyond that, and we have the one more slide, uh, Dana, right on the the yes. uh, this is issue. the yep. uh, focused look on the on, on some of the particular plans. Great, perfect. Yeah, thanks. So yeah, so this is looking at the plans that that uh, Dana was was referencing um, before, or I guess as you're looking to 2023. These are the plans that currently have um, zero dollar cost share. You know, the pre pre deductible uh, zero dollar cost share for those initial uh, primary care and mental mental health visits. Um, the from Blue Cross, Blue Cross is non-standard uh, preferred plan at the bronze, gold, and silver level for all of the silver variations, with the exception of of silver 94, and then MVPs, um, Vermont Plus bronze, five plan as as well, um, and we see that really looking over the last two years from from 2020 to 21, and then again from 21 to 2022. Um, that the the growth in enrollment in those plans uh, outpaced the the enrollment in um, in the marketplace overall. Um, as as we referenced, there was that uh, nearly eight percent drop um, in enrollment overall from 2020 to 2021, and yet these plans uh, had a, a three three percent gain. And then from this year, looking at that, just over 5% gain and about a 17% gain for these plans. So they were, you know, out. These plans were outpacing overall enrollment by by 11 to 12 points um, over those those two years. And and you see some um, differences in the two years between MVP and, and Blue Cross. I think largely attributed to the um, fact that in in 21 from 2021, MVP had uh, you know smaller premium increases and they have relatively larger premium increases in, in 2022 while while Blue Crosses were um, were lower and had more more movement in, um, in that direction. So we wanted to, to share this information as, as well. Um, you know, I've thrown a lot of information at you. <laughs> may or may not be in the direction you're interested in. Happy to talk about any other uh, components or any other pieces that we can either answer now or circle back on. Thank you, Sean. Um, members of the board, do you have any questions or comments for Sean or Dana? Hi, it's Robin. Thank you, Sean. You know I love the enrollment report. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Um, and a little Christmas present, right? When we get the data out at the beginning of the year, see how we did. <laughs> I love it. Um, and it it's particularly helpful to me this year when we're looking at uh, this issue around the zero cost share and which plans it makes sense uh, for because it's it's just important to understand where people are buying and which plans have more enrollment and so that we can factor that into our decision. So that's super helpful. Um, I know that you, VHC, does not have the direct enrollment information directly because folks are enrolling with the carriers, but I'm wondering, and this isn't entirely fair to ask you, but I'm wondering if it's possible to get the breakdown um, for the for that part of the population, because you know, seven thousand is still a significant chunk of people. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We can. We we do get it um, from from the issuers. We haven't gotten the January figures yet. We we just got the December um, figures. I think last last week is the is the time frame that um, they're reported to our team. So we will get them um, later on this this month for I think the end of February will be when we will should get the, the issuer numbers final numbers for for January and then when we put out our, our quarterly uh, health insurance map um, we'll pick those numbers in there um, and as far as any you know breakdowns or plans or doing something similar to this um, I believe we'd be happy to, to do it when we have that data as as well um, and when we said the 7,000 I think the some of the preliminary Numbers were looked at. I think the um, seems like the the direct enroll numbers should be more around six thousand, maybe just a hair under six thousand for 
um, for January of, of 2022 based on some of the prelim preliminary non non final non official numbers, but that's kind great. of what we're looking at there. Thank you, thank you very thank you. much. Uh, great, and I'd appreciate getting that when it's available. And I love the quarterly health insurance map too. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Okay, other board members, questions or comments? Yeah, I have a in, in general now. To question, okay, I have a couple. Um, I kind of like went back through and kind of looked at all the, there's like 21 adjustments uh, across all these four plans uh, that you presented us. Uh, that's assuming that the ones for the primary care physician kind of net out with the uh, changes to the, the specialist. So I kind of view them as, a, as one bundle. But um, in that population, there are eight that have increases of 6.3% or more, all the way up to 100%. I think it's the uh, emergency room uh, one for the silver, one of the silver plans is up from 250 to $500. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that's all interesting. But I'm wondering if, if you, during your process, have a, uh, do some kind of a calculation that figures out what is the gross number of, 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 of these uh, adjustments, um, you know, because when we go through rate review on the same QHP plans, you know, we can see the the gross premiums up and down, and and kind of see the the top side moving parts. But here, it's broken down into such small little corners that it's hard to see. So I'm wondering if, in your process, uh, do you calculate what what the impact is of these cost sharing changes? on members uh i can start to respond to that and and then i might i'll uh, ask wakely to add anything that i may have missed but um to start with i think um in our process we are first of all i think looking toward um yeah to take your example of the uh, increase in emergency room that is an area where we we, you know, not to say that it wouldn't be used, but we want to encourage utilization of the um, of primary care and in other settings over emergency room wherever possible. Um, and so that's more why that particular benefit or service was selected over any other reason. And I, the dollar amount is really much more a function of the magnitude needed to move the needle on actuarial value than it is anything else. So is that, you know, to double that one cost share is an uncomfortable trade-off that, that you know, we've spoken about, you know, in other areas, but um, having to double that was what it took to get the AV within range um, if we're going to focus on that benefit. And so it's much more about that than, um, and I would say too that it, I don't really think it's possible to draw a straight line between a decision like that and the actual impact on the rate, the premium rate, which is taking in so many, so many uh, multiples of factors than just that one increase. So, uh, Brittany, what else would you? Add or Julie add to that that be helpful. Yeah, the one thing I would add is that it it really depends on the member. Each member is going to feel these increases a little bit differently depending on their personal needs um, and the types of services that they use. Uh, the AV um, the actuarial value is meant to be an estimate of the um, portion of services that the, the carriers are paying versus the members. Um, so those changes in, in AV can be used as, as kind of an estimate in terms of the portion that the member is paying versus what the carrier is paying for services on average. Um, as we've talked about, there are some caveats with the actuarial value calculator um, and the, the premium impacts as well. But but the intent is really that that's supposed to kind of show on average how those uh, how those distributions um, 
play out in, in terms of the, the previous plan designs and the new plan designs and those changes. I, I, I follow that 85% of that, um, but I'm still, I'm still wondering is that when I'm talking to a member of the public about cost sharing, um, and we go through this process and they know that we go through this process and they ask, well, how much did you raise uh, cost the, 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 the cost of cost sharing you know, by these changes? Um, and I, I don't know whether we're in a $2 million world or a $15 million world or, and, and that's kind of that magnitude would get, you know, would be helpful. I have a couple of other related questions, but so, uh, so that, that's not that's not a number. That's not a value that that you calculate off this process as to what the net increase is, um, um, you know, in these cost sharing uh, adjustments. No, it, it's something we have not calculated. Um. OK, so my next question, um, I only have two or three questions here. Um, was just I'm just looking at some of the you know the language that was in the slides and uh, these are kind of quotes from the slide. Uh, increased cost sharing will limit the impact on premium. That's one. And making incremental changes each year can help to avoid larger changes in future years. And so my question is, how do we can we track? I mean, because it it, it seems like a. a um, Kind of a Rube Goldberg process here in a way is that we have this process and it has its integrity. Um, but then when we get over to the carriers, they use their methodology. And so I'm just trying to figure out, is there a way to understand as we're going through rate review, what these changes mean in, in our rate review process? Because that's mostly premium focus. And, uh, you know, and I, I actually think Sometimes you forget that there was this whole other process that preceded the the rate review process, where um, you know that that dealt with the cost sharing side of of, of, the, of revenues associated with this. So, is is there a way to have some clarity as to how some linkage uh, between this process and the rate review process, so that we can see what we're doing holistically? you know, to folks out there in terms of both premiums and cost sharing simultaneously. I think it's very challenging to draw a straight line between the. This process and the rate process, they were premium um, proposals because of the, you know, they're very, I think they're just so different when the focus for ours is to um, use whatever levers we have to influence the actuarial value to bring that into compliance. Um, the It's difficult to explain, but the data point that Wakely gives us of the directional impact on premium is, you know, again, as, as uh, Wakely, Wakely has explained, it's uh, their own internal calculator that does that premium estimate in a directional viewpoint, understanding that the issuers will um, use their own data and experience and uh, factors um, within the same AV requirements to estimate or to propose their rates. So I, I just think it's a very difficult thing to tie together with precision. Um, I hope that's helpful as an explanation. I don't know what else you would add, Brittany, but uh, I hear your question. I, I'm just struggling to clarify how or if or how those two efforts can be tied together. Because I, I mean, the, reason, the reason I asked is that the, the thought kind of came to my mind as I'm going through this, that there are some increases here um, and I think that has to do with maybe um, uh, cleanly with there's a couple of plans in there where where the issue of premium impact was the only reason for the adjustment, um, it seemed. And um, I'd have to go back through the slides to find those two. But it was was 
making me wonder whether or not this process should be in the premium alignment business um, in that it is so obscure uh, that it goes from your process to the AV calculator and then it goes over to the carriers and then it goes through their calculator and it's pretty much mashed potatoes by the time you get through you know, the whole process. And I'm just wondering you know, whether or not we should be doing premium related impacts, i.e. changing cost sharing in order to affect premiums um, in this process. Um, because the, the, the ability as a public sector figure to follow that, I don't think exists. I, I don't, I mean, you just tried to explain it to me and I understand the narrative, but I don't, I don't find the numbers. And uh, um, so I, I don't even know the scale of it. I mean, how much, how much cushioning is there in, in these, these plan designs that are geared toward premium? I mean, Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP would be very interested in that because it's, it's their bundle, but um, how much is it? And I, I guess, Yes, we don't know at this point in time. One other example I can think of too that may be helpful is that, um, as you remember, there were some plans among the seven that we have uh, reviewed last week in this, um, where between 2022 and 2023, the plan design is still in AV compliance, but even with no changes to any, any cost share amounts, with from using one year's AV calculator to the next is likely to increase the uh, that directional uh, premium that Wickley would calculate for us simply because the underlying costs and the uh, of services within those plans would go up. So by changing nothing, even um, there's a there's a chance or a likelihood that the the uh, premium will go in that direction as well. If I might just jump in, I would say we have seen it in rate review. So, for example, uh, when we there is a discussion around the PTOT and Cairo co-payments, we did see that impact in rate review as a line item. So the fact that it's not typically called out as a major shift in premium to me is proof that do like having those tweaks in this process is minimizing the impact on the premium because otherwise it would show up as a benefit change impact in the rate review filing. Well, I, 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 I remember, remember the chiropractor, I remember that. And so, uh, you know, at the kind of micro level, the surgically, I, I think you're right. I, the questions I'm asking are more systematically so I can just get a sense of scale. Last question, but uh, I, I agree with Robin. I, I, the, um, I'm just wondering, um, kind of looking forward, how this process might evolve relative to healthcare reform in terms of fixed perspective payments and the different payment methodologies you know, that we're trying to migrate toward. Um, does, does, where, where does this design, this, this system, the, the, the plan design, fit into that future? Is there any discussion in that regard that you folks are having? We, we haven't factored that in at this point. I think the, you know, this process is very much driven by federal requirements with, around the actuarial values, but the um, payment mechanisms that may influence the plan design decisions that we would make would be Factored in sometime later. Well, thank you all. This is very every year. This is a you know a very complex web, and it's hard to kind of uh, swim through it, and and uh, and very hard, I think, to explain to the public. But these cost sharing things are a big deal to the public, and that's what you hear about. And uh, and this is where it happens. And and. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess I guess if I were, would ask, could have one wish is that next year as we go through this, can we have have as part of the presentation the de minimis plan? This is this is from a, a cost sharing point of view impact on 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 patient. This is the uh, this is the plan that 
that affects them the least on the cost sharing side. I'm sure I'm not phrasing that right, but I, I, I just feel, you know, when I'm looking at increases that are 6.3%, there's eight of them that are between 6.3% and 100% changes. And then on the other hand, when we go into hospital budget cycle, we're looking at three and a half percent and we're trying to stay in that ballpark in terms of premiums. These things jump out at me, but I I don't know if there's any problem there that can be solved. And that's pretty scary that I don't even know whether or not there's a problem. <laughs> but because um, I, I I've worked with you folks a little bit over the years, and I I trust your work. You do good work, and you know Sean was very helpful in terms of putting together those charts that profiled the folks above 400 percent of poverty, and I was very grateful for that. Um, but I I I wish I I had a better handle on this so that I could explain it to members of the public when I run into them into the co-op because it's it's not so much I hear about the premium it's the cost sharing thank you very much thank you other members of the board comments or questions I'm not hearing any um, at this yeah. point um, it might be better if someone is prepared to make a motion to make one and then I would go to public comment so if they could comment on um, what they've heard and the motion. Does anybody wish to, to make a motion? Go ahead, yeah, I'm Rob. I'm happy to make a motion. Tom Walsh looked like he was about to jump in, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, no, it's okay. All right, so I will, um, Dana, could you pull up the, I think it'd be easier to do this with the slide that has the changes on it so we can all see it. Yes, give me a moment to get my yes, no self in the right place. And maybe while we're getting there, I, I think, I think uh, what I'd like to do is two yes. motions. Thank you, that's perfect, Dana. Um, so that'll be because, fine because I think that like the first issue is whether or not to me, the first issue is whether or not we would like to accept the zero cost share, the three zero cost share visits on just silver and bronze or apply it to all the plans. Um, so it might make sense to to ha hash that piece out first. And then typically what I have done in the past is do motions to approve um, the plan designs that, that need changes as described on the slide, plus whatever else we changed. Does that sound okay, Chair Mullen? It sounds perfect. Okay, so then I'm going to move um, that we uh, approve three zero cost sharing visits for primary care and mental health for the deductible plans at every level, meaning bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. I will second that. And before I open it up to the public, uh, Dana or Sean, do you want to comment on that? No, that's that's understood for as I'm concerned. Okay. Agreed. Okay, so I'm going to open it up for uh, public comment, both on the motion or anything related to the um, QHP proposals. So members of the public, please raise your hand or um, if you're just on phone, just start talking. And the first hand that I see is Walter Carpenter. Walter. Faithful as always, right, Kevin? Yes. Um, Thanks to Tom for what he said in his comments. I was thinking almost the same thing as Tom. If he's having difficulty understanding this, imagine what the general public who has to pay all of this is trying to understand about it. And now I wanted to make a comment to the diva people is that when they talk about carriers paying versus public paying and all that, they should remember that we are the ones who are paying it no matter what. Always think of that. Carriers don't pay anything. We pay it. 
carriers just distribute plus what they take off for admin expenses, profits, all the rest of it. We pay it. All of it. Thank you, Walter. Comment. Is there other public comment? Uh, all of it. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, I'll go back to the board. Is there further discussion? I would just like to say that the reason why I think it's important to offer this benefit at uh, every metal level, even though I recognize um, the justification is certainly be, being a thoughtful one, is that I do think it's just much easier to be able to communicate that the benefit exists to the public. And there's, you know, with 28 or however much, 22 plans that we have now, it. Uh, I appreciate the difficulty of the public and shopping. And so my main intent here is to ensure that uh, people seek and use the primary care and mental health benefits at every level and that they know that that's available to them. So I just wanted to explain my rationale. Thank you. And Dana and Sean, do, does that uh, keep us within the actuarial values that we have to keep within? Yes, everything presented is is within the um, compliant ranges. Perfect. Other board members, comments or questions? Yeah, just one quick question. I I think I support this. I'm ninety percent there. I'm just wondering <laughs> is there is there any impact on um, primary care physicians on this? I mean, is there any risk uh, to their cash flows? Uh, by not getting the cost sharing from the um, uh, platinum and gold folks. No, they would still be reimbursed by the by the uh, insurance company for their right. services. So it's just a matter of um, okay. you know, for those particular services, there wouldn't be a, a a cost to the enrollee. If anything, Tom, I would think it would be less of a paper chase. Well, I, I agree. These things are so complicated. I just had wanted to ask the question just to uh, just to be sure, <laughs> and not find out later that I'd I'd really messed up. So yep. um, I, I'm on board. I'm on board too. I mean, I think reducing barriers to entry to you know uh, primary care and mental health is so crucial, and and we need to do that at every possibility for every meta level. So I'm supportive of this. OK, not hearing any further discussion. I'll call the motion. All those in favor of the motion for um, the three across all uh, uh, metal levels. Um, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously and Robin will go to your second motion. Yes, so I would like, I move that we approve uh, the- You want to put that uh, chart back up, Dana? Yeah, that, that might be easier. Um, but let me get started anyway. Um, I move that we approve the 2023 Qualified Health Plan designs uh, as uh, presented by the Department of Vermont Health Access with the modifications uh, just made in particular the plan designs highlighted in uh, green on slide 39 of the presentation. Is there a second? Yeah, I see sorry. some head shaking. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I couldn't get to my mute button fast enough, but I will second it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, just to make sure that everybody has a chance, if they have any further comment, I'll throw it open to the public for public comment one more time on this particular motion. Does anybody wish to offer public comment on the motion just made by board member Lunge? Hearing none, is there further discussion from the board? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously.
if I can just break in for one clarification, you just may. to make sure. Um, so the approval is for uh, the, the, the zero cost share uh, options for each of the four metal levels. That's understood. And in other instance, instances, it's the recommended plan design. Yes. Thank okay. you for clarifying. Yes. Just want to make crystal clear. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Always good. Thank you, Dana. Yep. Okay, well, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Sean. Thank you uh, to your consultants as well. And um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board today? Is there any new business to come before the board today? I just want to remind all the board members that uh, we do have a deliberation session scheduled for 10 minutes after the uh, end of this meeting. Um, so please don't forget. And um, with that, I wish everybody a, a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. Did, thank do you. you need a motion to adjourn, Kevin? Yes, I do. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.